On the morning of June 1st, 2018, a man named Mark Powers was hiking through California's Joshua Tree National Park when he saw something that he had never seen before. While walking through an area of desert just off of one of the main roads, he saw a large group of birds that looked like they were gathering around something on the ground. Recognizing that the birds were vultures, Mark decided to take a closer look. When he did, he saw that they were picking away at what appeared to be the partial remains of a dead animal. Not entirely sure what he was looking at, he snapped a couple of pictures before proceeding to go on with the rest of his day. Mark didn't think much of the whole situation until he recounted the experience to his wife the next day. As she was studying the photos he had taken, her demeanor began to change. After pausing for a few moments, she said she was pretty sure that they needed to call the police. While Mark's wife's intuitions would soon be proven correct, neither of them could have predicted the true horror of what they had uncovered. From this lonely section of desert, investigators would soon trace a twisted path, one filled with jealousy, addiction, secrets, and lies. After receiving a concerned call from Mark Powers and his wife, rangers at Joshua Tree National Park were sent out to investigate the situation. Luckily, Mark remembered the area he had been in when he took the photos and was able to provide directions. The place was located not far from Bighorn Pass Road, a route which branches off of one of the main roads through Joshua Tree and which is located approximately equal distance between the Jumbo Rocks Campground and the Hidden Valley Nature Trailhead. Upon arriving, it was immediately clear that something unusual was going on. In addition to the vultures that Mark had seen the previous day, rangers spotted a coyote lurking around. Not something which they would generally expect to see during broad daylight hours. Not long after, they noticed an area of disturbed ground about 15 feet from the roadway. Closer examination would reveal that it was actually a shallow grave. One that contained the partial remains of a middle-aged man. Because of the condition of these remains, it was clear that they had been there for at least a few days. In that time, animals had gotten to the lower half of the body, which is what Mark had seen and photographed. Realizing that they were almost certainly looking at a crime scene, it was at this point that the rangers called for detectives from the Riverside County Sheriff's Office. One of the first things detectives concluded after arriving and beginning to process the scene was that the desert burial site probably wasn't where their male victim had actually been killed. Even with the advanced level of decomposition, it was obvious that he had sustained multiple violent injuries, injuries which would have left behind evidence. However, there was nothing to indicate that an attack of that kind had taken place here. In fact, there was really no evidence to speak of. One thing that did jump out to investigators, though, was the seemingly careless nature of the burial. The shallow grave was only two feet at its deepest, and its proximity to one of the National Park's roads had made it much more likely that it would be discovered. To detectives, this suggested that whoever was responsible was inexperienced and may have been in a rush to cover up the crime. The victim's remains were sent off to the Riverside County Coroner's Office for an autopsy, which revealed additional disturbing information. The man had suffered several major skull fractures, the result of massive blunt force trauma to the head. His cause of death was therefore determined to be homicidal violence. Despite the challenges posed by the state of the victim's remains, coroners managed to obtain a usable fingerprint from the victim, which authorities submitted for testing. Two days later, a match was found to a sample in the state's Department of Motor Vehicles database. Their victim was a 54-year-old man named Henry Stange. It turned out that Henry lived in the city of Marietta, well over a 100-mile drive from where his body had been found. As investigators would soon learn, he hadn't been seen there in nearly two weeks. It was here that they would make their next chilling discovery. After obtaining a warrant, a team from the Riverside County Sheriff's Office was sent to conduct a search of Henry Stange's home. When they arrived, they found that no one was there and that all of the entrances were locked, leading them to force their way in through the front door. Upon entering, at first, nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary. 
The house looked to be just the way that Henry might have left it, and there were no signs of anything missing or out of place. It was as if Henry had simply stepped out for a moment and would be coming right back. All of that changed, though, when police made their way into the 54-year-old's garage. That's where they encountered a truly horrifying scene. Dried blood was littered in places all over the room. There was spatter on various items that had been crowded into the small space, as well as on the concrete floor. The largest amount of blood was towards the back of the garage, where a large pool of it had dried on the floor. There would have been even more, except that someone had made a half-hearted cleanup attempt, indicated by a pile of towels and the heavy smell of bleach that still hung in the air. Based on the amount of blood, all of which was later determined to belong to Henry, authorities concluded that this is where he had been killed. From the autopsy, they already knew that he had been the victim of a brutal attack, though seeing this gave them more information about how the crime had unfolded. There had clearly been a struggle, during which Henry had fallen to the ground. Once there, the assault had continued. Chillingly, it appeared that one of the weapons that had been used to inflict the fatal blows had been a plate from one of Henry's own barbell sets. Unfortunately for detectives, the killer hadn't left behind any fingerprints, DNA, or other physical evidence. However, they did notice something else. There were cables hanging from the rafters that looked like they might have previously been connected to security cameras. While it was obviously a setback not to have this potential footage, it signaled to authorities that whoever was responsible for Henry's murder likely had some familiarity with his home. After all, the cleanup and burial were such rush jobs that unless the killer already knew where the cameras were, they likely would have missed them. Of course, knowing how Henry died was only one piece of the puzzle. In order to find out who had done this and why, investigators knew they would need to turn to the people that knew him best. When detectives reached out to Henry Stange's family, they were understandably heartbroken at the news of his brutal murder. His mother Caroline said that she had been trying to reach her son for several days and had been growing steadily more concerned at his lack of response. However, she had never suspected something like this. Henry's sisters, Diana and Judy, were similarly devastated. Family members described Henry as the kind of person who was always willing to lend a hand to someone in need and who was gifted in a lot of different areas. He was a talented musician, had a knack for working with electronics, and was passionate about anything to do with the outdoors. He enjoyed camping, hiking, and loved animals of any kind. That being said, Henry's life hadn't been without its challenges, especially within the last few years. It had started when he was in a life-altering motorcycle accident. One day, Henry had been parked outside of a house getting ready to leave when he was struck out of nowhere by a drunk driver. This person had dragged Henry for about half a mile before finally coming to a stop. While Henry had been able to survive by grabbing onto the vehicle's bumper and holding on for dear life, the accident had caused severe damage to one of his legs. He was left with a permanent limp, as well as intense chronic pain. In order to help with his pain, Henry had been prescribed oxycodone. The medication allowed him to get through the day, but sadly, he eventually became dependent on it. As this dependence grew, the drug began to affect almost all other aspects of his life in a negative way. It made it difficult for him to hold down a job, and eventually, it had also cost him his marriage. In 2017, his wife of 20 years had filed for divorce and had taken their two young children with her. Naturally, Henry's ex-wife was one of the first people that police considered as a possible person of interest, especially after learning some of the details of their divorce. Multiple people described the split as extremely bitter and said that there had been a drawn-out dispute over their house. But when authorities sat down with Henry's ex and interviewed her, she seemed genuinely stunned and heartbroken by his murder. She said that despite everything that had happened between them, she had no actual ill will towards Henry, and that he was still the father of her children. Although she said she had moved out of their Murrieta home a while ago, Henry's ex-wife said she was the one paying the utility bills and was able to provide these records to detectives. They revealed a crucial detail. 
usage of power and water at the residence had abruptly stopped on May 24th. As a result, investigators concluded that this was likely the day that Henry had been killed. With Henry's ex-wife cleared of suspicion in his murder, detectives began to explore new possible motives behind the crime. It wasn't long before something interesting caught their attention. According to Henry's family, as the hardships in his life had grown over the past couple of years, Henry had increasingly taken to pouring his time and energy into his favorite hobby, ham radio. As previously mentioned, he was skilled at working with electronics, and among other things, liked to build his own antennas and share his knowledge with fellow enthusiasts. That wasn't all that had attracted him to the hobby, though. Apparently, Henry also enjoyed speaking his mind over the airwaves. In fact, he had developed quite a reputation in the ham radio community for his over-the-top persona, taking a no-holds-barred approach and saying whatever was on his mind. Understandably, not everyone was a fan of Henry's inflammatory approach to radio. This had led to frequent and petty fights between him and other operators, some of whom took to recording themselves baiting Henry into arguments just to see what he would say before posting the resulting content on social media or in ham radio online forums. When police delved into these forums, they discovered plenty of animosity directed at Henry, especially from a pair of brothers in the community who seemed to have a particular hatred towards him. However, just like with all threats and disturbing posts on the internet, it was difficult to discern who was simply projecting and who might have meant serious business. All that being said, there were two pieces of information the detectives found deeply unsettling. First, they learned from Henry's family that about four months before his murder, in January of 2018, he had been attacked at his house during the middle of the night. Henry had confided in those close to him that he believed some members of the ham radio community could have been responsible. And in fact, this is why he had installed the now missing surveillance cameras in his garage. The second piece of information police learned was that Henry had disappeared shortly after his final radio broadcast. That broadcast had happened on May 24th, the same day that they knew utilities had abruptly stopped being used at his house. Detectives theorized that perhaps the two incidents were linked. Maybe whoever had attacked Henry in January had been listening in on May 24th and had decided to come back and finish the job. Things got more complicated when authorities actually started speaking with members of the local ham radio community who told them that they had heard about the January attack on Henry as well. It turned out that he had talked about it openly on the air, though most people had initially dismissed it, believing that Henry was making the whole thing up. Several said that he had a penchant for telling wildly embellished stories. He would talk about his supposedly lavished lifestyle, claim he lived in the same neighborhood as A-list celebrities, and had bragged about having a beautiful young girlfriend. A few people police spoke to said it got easier to write off a lot of what Henry said after pictures of his actual house had been posted by a couple of his enemies in an online forum, revealing that a lot of what he'd said about himself was fabricated. Despite Henry's exaggerations, after conducting their interviews, detectives were confident that he had been telling the truth about the January attack at his home. Interestingly, they would soon discover that there was at least one other thing he had been truthful about, and it would turn out to be the key to solving his murder. When 30-year-old Curtis Kruger and 27-year-old Ashley Stapp met in early 2017, the attraction between them was instant. At the time, Curtis was a first lieutenant in the Marines, stationed at the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center in the city of 29 Palms while Ashley was a community college student from the city of Canyon Lake. Curtis's cousin Angeline, a co-worker of Ashley's at Jamba Juice, had asked her to feed and walk her family's dog while they were away on a trip to Mexico. Curtis happened to be staying at the property on the weekends, and when he and Ashley stumbled across each other there, they immediately hit it off. They started dating not long after, and from here, the relationship moved quickly. Over the next few months, the couple became more and more enmeshed in each other's lives. On weekends, when Curtis was off from the base, they would spend as much time as possible together, often camping out in the desert. 
they introduced each other to their respective families. Ashley started coming onto the military base to take part in events for loved ones of service members, and they even began discussing marriage. Around this same time, Curtis wrote in a journal entry on his phone about Ashley, quote, she literally seems perfect. However, as more time passed and the honeymoon phase of their relationship ended, Curtis started to get a strange feeling about Ashley. He began to notice that she was unreachable for large chunks of time and that she never seemed to have good explanations for her whereabouts. Soon, other red flags started to crop up. When Curtis and Ashley were together, he would sometimes catch her on her phone looking like she was messaging someone. Ashley would never tell Curtis who she was talking to, telling him it was nothing to worry about, though it seemed she was quite emotionally invested in these exchanges, to the point that she would sometimes become visibly angry or upset. Deciding that he had to find out what was going on, Curtis came up with a plan. After Ashley got lost in the desert one night while driving near the military base, he convinced her to share her cell phone location data with him. From then on, Curtis began monitoring her whereabouts, paying close attention to her movements. It was this that convinced him once and for all that she had been lying to him. On January 22, 2018, Curtis used Ashley's location data to follow her to a gas station in southwestern Riverside County. It was here that he would confront her, and Ashley would agree to share what she had been hiding. As detectives were wrapping up their initial interviews with the friends and family members of Henry Stange, their primary focus was learning more about his potential enemies in the ham radio community. After all, Henry himself had been wary that someone in the hobby might have it out for him. And after seeing the hate for him online, it certainly seemed like this could have been a motive for murder. However, just before police could move on with the investigation, Henry's ex-wife offered another piece of information that she thought might be useful. At the time of his death, Henry had a new woman in his life. Her name was Ashley Stapp. When detectives asked other family members about this, they stated that they knew about Ashley as well and said that they had definitely had reservations about this relationship. Ashley was much younger than Henry, and it seemed like things between the two of them were moving very quickly. However, Henry's sisters said that when they tried to voice their concerns, Henry wouldn't hear it. He said that Ashley was everything he ever wanted in a woman, and that he thought he was in love. It seemed that she was the beautiful young girlfriend he had bragged about over his radio. While this was enough on its own to get police interested in speaking with Ashley, things got a whole lot more interesting when they spoke to one of Henry's neighbors. This neighbor said that she would often wave to Ashley as she got to Henry's place, and that she drove a blue Honda Civic with distinctive damage to the front end. The last time she had seen the car was on the same day that police had discovered the crime scene at Henry's house. The vehicle had driven past while officers were processing the garage for evidence. To detectives, this was extremely suspicious. If Ashley had driven past Henry's house and had seen a bunch of police, why hadn't she stopped to see what was going on? Or at the very least, why hadn't she reached out to Henry's family to ask if he was okay? Investigators only became more suspicious when they looked up Ashley Stapp and quickly discovered that she was dating a first lieutenant in the Marines named Curtis Kruger. From the looks of it on social media, the relationship was a serious one. Wondering if Henry, Ashley, and Curtis might have been caught up in some sort of love triangle, authorities obtained cell phone records for Curtis and Ashley on May 24th, the day that Henry abruptly stopped using the utilities at his home and disappeared from the airwaves. Sure enough, the records showed that both phones were in the vicinity of Henry's house that day. Knowing that they would need to build more of a case before accusing Ashley or Curtis of anything, detectives decided to take an interesting approach. Rather than directly questioning either of them, they obtained wiretaps for Ashley and Curtis's phones, then set a clever plan into motion. Once again, instead of going to either Ashley or Curtis directly, Authorities went to speak with Ashley's brother, Kevin, who happened to live close to a local police station. While talking with Kevin, they showed him a photo of Ashley and Henry together. 
inquiring as to whether he knew anything about a potential crime. Kevin said that he had no idea who the man was, but that the other person in the photo was his sister Ashley. Acting as though this was new information to them, police then asked Kevin if he wouldn't mind sending the picture to Ashley to see if she might have any information, to which he agreed. Within minutes, this set off a chain reaction, exactly the one investigators were hoping for. So this morning, the police came to my door, some detectives, and they were asking if I knew any information on a crime. They showed me a picture of this dude that I've never seen before and you, and they said that they found it at his house. I don't know where that picture is taken, and I don't know what crime it would be. At first, Ashley called Kevin, denying that she knew anything about the photo with Henry or any crime. Of course, this is exactly what authorities had expected her to do. It was the next call that they actually cared about. The one that she made to Curtis Kruger, where they began to implicate themselves in Henry's murder, discussing not only how they had gotten rid of his body, but also how anyone could have known that they were involved. We pulled in close enough, I guarantee you, by the lip of the roof, that they wouldn't have showed he was loaded into the back of my truck. But, like, it just makes me wonder if a neighbor or something, like, said, yeah, I saw a black truck leaving. It was that dumb girl that waved hi to us when we were leaving, I'm sure. Somebody waved by? Yeah. That wasn't all, though. As investigators listened in, Ashley and Curtis confirmed their theory about the missing surveillance cameras from Henry's garage, and even went as far as to tie themselves directly to Joshua Tree National Park, where the body had been found. He, like, hooked it up himself. He, like, put up his own cameras. He put up the antennas at his house. That's how I knew where all of them were. Could be potentially a camera at the entrance of Joshua Tree Park. After hearing Ashley and Curtis share numerous details about Henry Stange's murder that they believed only the perpetrators would know, they finally arrested both of them and brought them in for questioning. Ashley was the first to be interviewed and initially denied any involvement in the crime. However, that quickly changed when authorities confronted her with the wiretap recordings they had collected. She admitted that she had been present at the time of the murder and had seen Henry's body lying in the garage. Obviously, you were asking about the crime. Yeah, because I think you may be involved with that crime. I don't want to be involved. What do you see when you get into the crime? I saw body, like that, and body, and blood. Okay. Even after admitting that she was there when Henry was murdered, though, Ashley attempted to hold back details about what had happened. In particular, it seemed that she was trying to remain as vague as possible when it came to saying who had actually been responsible for killing Henry. That's when detectives revealed that they already knew who else was there that day. Ashley's boyfriend, Curtis Kruger. I'm telling you, we know that your friend is Curtis. There's no secret there. Right? You should be taking yes. As soon as Curtis's name was mentioned, Ashley completely broke down. She said that she had been dating both him and Henry, and that when Curtis found out about their relationship, he became progressively more jealous. Things had come to a head on May 24th, when Curtis showed up while she was at Henry's house. He had killed Henry in a rage, after which she had helped him to cover up the crime. I didn't know that you would show up. I didn't know you would do that. Following Ashley's confession, detectives attempted to speak with Curtis Kruger. However, he refused to admit anything and quickly lawyered up. Police weren't all that concerned about this until they attempted to take their case to the district attorney's office. To their shock, they were told that the investigation wasn't finished, and as a result, they wouldn't be bringing charges against either Curtis or Ashley faced with no other choice, authorities were forced to release them. Though it seemed for a moment that the case might die here, fortunately for detectives, it was at this point that they were approached by representatives from the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. For those unfamiliar, the NCIS is the primary investigative law enforcement agency for the Navy. They had good news for detectives. 
Since Curtis was an active member of the Marines, he was subject to their jurisdiction. And if the Riverside County District Attorney's Office wasn't going to charge him, they were. Once again, Curtis was arrested, and this time placed in custody at a military facility. As luck would have it, it was around this same time that investigators received a call that would give them one of the last pieces of the puzzle that they needed to bring the case home. Little did they know, it would also expose a tangled web of secrets and lies. After taking over the Henry Stange murder case, NCIS investigators received a phone call out of the blue from a woman who said that she had information to share. That woman's name was Angeline, Curtis Kruger's cousin. Angeline explained that months before the murder, Curtis had made a startling confession to her. He had attacked someone with a hammer. She now believed that this someone was Henry Stange. The revelation shed new light on the January attack at Henry's home. It turned out that he had been wrong about it being a disgruntled member of the ham radio community. He had never suspected that Ashley was the reason that he had been targeted. After speaking with Angeline, authorities went back to Ashley to confront her with this new information. This time, she was far quicker to provide her version of events. She began by jumping back to January 22nd, the day that Curtis had confronted her at the gas station. Ashley said that when Curtis arrived that evening, she admitted that she had been secretly cheating on him with Henry for months. This had sent Curtis into a rage. He demanded that he take her to Henry's house. After making the short drive, Ashley said Curtis had grabbed a framing hammer from the back of his truck and had told her to wait there while he went inside. He broke in, attacked Henry, and they fled the scene. Initially, Ashley said both she and Curtis believed that he had killed Henry. However, she still went to check on him the next day. He was badly hurt, but still alive, and she said that despite what had happened, she had continued her relationships with both men. Obviously, Curtis had figured this out, and this was how he had known where to go to find them on May 24th, when he had attacked Henry for a second time at his home. In order to back up her story, Ashley told investigators where they could find the framing hammer that Curtis had used in the first attack. He had thrown it somewhere out in the desert near the abandoned trailer he and Ashley used to camp out in on their weekends together. Luckily for authorities, the hammer was still there. When they found it, it had a distinctive bend in it, indicating just how brutal the assault had been. The evidence was even enough for the Riverside County DA's office to jump back in, who now believed that there was enough to proceed with the case. With that, Curtis Kruger was charged with murder. As for Ashley, she too would be charged. However, her situation would become a lot more controversial. As it turned out, detectives had only really gotten half of the story. You see, despite what she had told detectives about the January confrontation between her and Curtis at the gas station, Ashley had not actually explained the true nature of her relationship with Henry. Instead, the secret she had revealed was that she was addicted to prescription painkillers, in particular, oxycodone. Her drug habit was costing her $600 a day. Ashley told Curtis that for several months she had been getting pills from Henry, who had agreed to share with her because he had plenty for his ongoing pain problems. She claimed that he was her drug dealer, nothing more. In order to try and cover up the sexual relationship, she claimed that Henry had sexually assaulted her. It was this that apparently had sent Curtis into the rage on January 22nd, prompting the first attack. It was only later, when Curtis discovered that Ashley was continuing to see Henry, that he started to believe that she was actually lying to him about infidelity. Authorities figured this out when they obtained search warrants for Curtis's phone and electronic devices, where they found months worth of notes and journal entries he had made to himself. As time went on, he had began to question the stories Ashley was telling him until things had finally come to a head on May 24th. On that day, Ashley was supposed to come to the military base at 29 Palms for a family golf event. However, when she failed to show up, Curtis got suspicious. As he had been doing for some time, he tracked Ashley's phone, discovering that it was at her parents' place in Canyon Lake. The only problem was that Ashley's parents were out of town. 
By this time, Ashley knew that Curtis was tracking her, so she had thrown her phone in the potted plant at her house to try and cover her tracks before going to Henry's. However, Curtis figured this out and made his way there to confront them. Upon arriving, Curtis and Henry had gotten into a heated exchange in the garage, one that had quickly escalated. During the struggle, Curtis brutally beat Henry to death, after which he and Ashley had covered up the crime by trying to do a hasty cleanup and taking Henry's remains out to Joshua Tree to bury them. When Curtis Kruger went on trial in August of 2020, prosecutors argued that he had killed Henry because he was jealous of his relationship with Ashley and that the love triangle between them had pushed him over the edge. The defense, meanwhile, argued that both Curtis and Henry had found themselves unknowingly caught in Ashley's double life and that she had manipulated them both into a deadly situation. In the end, it seems that the jury came down somewhere in between. Based on the evidence, it was clear that Curtis had killed Henry, though they didn't believe he had specifically shown up with that intention on May 24th. As a result, he was found guilty of second-degree murder instead of first, and was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison. Ashley, meanwhile, was offered a deal and would only plead guilty to accessory after the fact, and was sentenced to 10 months in jail, three years probation, and was ordered to attend a drug rehabilitation program. She would later be briefly sent back to jail after failing to complete the rehab program and leaving early. Understandably, Henry's family struggled with how things played out in court. While they felt Curtis was rightfully punished, they were stunned and outraged by the comparatively light sentence Ashley received considering her level of involvement. At the time of this recording, Curtis Kruger remains incarcerated while Ashley Stapp has long since been released and, as far as we can tell, is a free woman. I don't know about you, but this story really threw me for a loop. It's one of those cases that reminds you just how wildly a lie can spiral out of control and makes you question if you can ever really know someone. Honestly, even after everything, it's sort of unclear exactly what the truth was as far as Ashley is concerned. At various points, she went from saying that her relationship with Henry was real to saying that she was only using him for drugs. Perhaps like everything else in this case, the truth is somewhere in between. Like with any crime involving addiction, people's motives and actions often don't make sense. So maybe even trying to work things out logically after the fact is just the wrong approach altogether. Truthfully, I don't know. The thing that definitely bothers me the most, though, is that while Ashley and Curtis now have the opportunity to have some sort of a life after all of this, the same can't be said for Henry Stange. He'll never get that chance. And that is arguably the greatest tragedy of all. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, Thanks so much, everyone, and take care.